On August 27th, 1980, the Winnipeg Tribune published its final newspaper, thus ending a proud 90-year history in Winnipeg. And on that date, publisher Bill Wheatley issued the following statement. It is with sorrow, he wrote, I write this final note to you. It is sad whenever a newspaper fails. It is even sadder when that newspaper has succeeded in every way but one, financially. The newspaper may be gone, but its memory survives here at the Department of Archives and Special Collections at the University of Manitoba. And since its acquisition, the so-called Trib Collection has become one of the most utilized and popular of all of our holdings. Through the pages, we'll concentrate on a seven-day period in the Tribune's history, and we'll investigate some of the leading stories of the day and concentrate on a headline event that impacted on Manitoba history. Not surprisingly, the individual newspapers dating back to 1890 have not survived the ravages of time. However, the entire collection has been preserved on rolls of microfilm here in the department. This roll of microfilm contains the dates March the 5th to May the 8th, 1912. The unsinkable Titanic weighed 46,328 tons, was 11 stories high, one-sixth of a mile long, and cost $10 million to build. The White Star Liner left Southampton, England for New York on the 12th of April, 1912, carrying 2,207 passengers and crew. Many who booked passage on the luxury liner's maiden voyage possessed great wealth. Ten Winnipeggers were among the ship's passengers. Local real estate tycoon Mark Fortune was traveling with his wife, three daughters, and a son. Hugo Ross, director of Associated Charities, and B.D. Thompson, a real estate agent, were returning to Winnipeg after a trip that had taken them to Cairo, Egypt. George Graham, a buyer for Eaton's China Department, and realtor J.J. Borbank were also on board. The week is April the 15th to the 22nd, an unforgettable week in history, 1912. Mammoth vessel strikes iceberg. Passengers are removed in lifeboats. Titanic on maiden voyage meets with accident off Newfoundland coast, scream the headlines. Vessel begins to sink at bow and help summoned by wireless. The canard liner Carpathia, called by an aerial flash asking aid, rushed assistance to the Titanic in the darkness off Newfoundland today and took on board 1,300 passengers of the Titanic. The passengers taken off were transferred to the Carpathia without a single life lost, according to a dispatch received here this afternoon. 600 were removed at dawn, then after a cessation of a few hours on account of the heavy wind, rescue work was continued. After the wind abated, the remainder of the passengers were saved. Part of the passengers subsequently were transferred to the Virginian, which followed up the Carpathia to the scene of the disaster. Later, the Parisian came up and the latest reports received say the Titanic is low in the water. Captain Smith and the crew hope to be able to bring the Titanic into Halifax, where it will be docked for repairs. The first headlines seem to indicate a lack of full understanding of the story. Notice this one on the third column, will be pictures. W.H. Harbeck, Canadian cinemagraph operator, is aboard the Titanic being sent to obtain films of incidents of the initial voyage how valuable they would have been. And on the bottom of this first page, mammoth vessel sinking. On her maiden voyage from Southampton, she struck an iceberg and was sinking. 1,300 passengers were quickly removed and the vessel taken in tow to port, obviously without full understanding of the dimensions of the tragedy. On board the Titanic, pictures here of Winnipeggers Mark Fortune, well-known local businessman, and Hugo Ross. Mr. Fortune took out a insurance policy with the Winnipeg-based Great West Life Assurance Company 
the largest insurance policy the company had ever offered just one week before the voyage of the Titanic, almost as if he had a premonition of the forecoming sinking. Sharing space with the preliminary news of the sinking of the Titanic was the coverage of the Mississippi flood, working more havoc in Louisiana. An interesting comparison to the 1993 floods in and on the Mississippi River. This being in Louisiana where the river a mile and a half wide was spilling all over the Louisiana countryside. And on the local scene, girls strangled to death in bed in red light area. Giselle Roberts found dead by a companion this morning. Pitiable spectacle. Unknown assailant escaped secretly and police are in pursuit all over city. Many tragedies enacted in segregated area. Police supervision proves ineffective. Eva Miller, 176 McFarland Street, shot by a Negro with whom she would not live. Mail Ford, 149 McFarland Street, shot by friends. Germaine Giraud, 178 McFarland Street, shot by Edward Sulse. Giselle Roberts, 176 McFarland Street, strangled. Giselle Roberts, known to her friends as Minion and one of the prettiest girls in Winnipeg's red light areas, is lying cold in death in Thompson's undertaking rooms while detectives are scouring the city for her murderer. It was one of the most cold-blooded crimes ever committed in Winnipeg, for the poor girl was lying asleep at the time her assailant committed the dastardly deed. The discovery of the murder was made by accident. Marie Fredon, another inmate of the house, wanted some medicine for which she had to telephone, so she went to Mignon's room to see if she had anything that would give her relief, and was horrified to find that her friend was dead. With a wild scream, she rushed into the parlor adjoining, and Morel Dulac, keeper of the house, awoke. The two of them rushed into the street, screaming murder, and the red light district was awake at once. A constable patrolling the beach ran into the house and after one hasty glance at the dead girl telephoned to police headquarters and the machinery of the law was put in motion. Deputy Chief Newton, Chief of Detectives at Stogill, Detectives Kilcup, Morality Officer Eddy and several others hastened to the scene in taxicabs while the general alarm went forth to seek the two men who had been in the house shortly before but the descriptions given of them was very meager. However, every available man was put on the work furnished with the meager descriptions to the constable in broken French by the other inmates of the house. Every streetcar in the vicinity was carefully watched and plain-clothed officers at once went to the railway station. And this latest news flash on column 5 from New York, Titanic is sinking, 2 p.m., almost 14 hours after the Titanic had sunk. By early Tuesday, April the 16th, the full dimensions of the Titanic disaster had become obvious. In this headline, 868 passengers saved from the Titanic, 1,342 drowned. Carpathia picks up many passengers. The official announcement made by the White Star Line this afternoon that 868 survivors of the Titanic were picked up by the Carpathia makes the missing 1,342 1, lives. Officials say they had received positive news by wireless from the Olympic, which relayed Marconi Graham from the Carpathia. London, April 16th. Alex Carlyle, lately chief designer for Harland and the designer of both the Titanic and Olympic, in the course of an interview today said, When the news first came that the Titanic was sinking by the head, I thought it likely that she would reach the port. The fact that she sank within four hours after the impact with the ice indicates that her side was torn out. Number of boats carried. The apparent fact that the Titanic's boats were not sufficient to accommodate the ship's personnel is causing much comment here although the papers are chary of discussion on the subject. The law does not provide the number of boats the largest ship shall carry. It only applies to those vessels displacing up to 10,000 tons as it was passed before the present big ships had been built. Only wreckage found. Halifax, Nova Scotia, April 16th. Wireless station Cape Race reported this morning, now in communication with Parisian, no passengers on board, Commander of Parisian said. Searched vicinity of disaster, unable to find a soul. Great deal wreckage, that's all. Montreal. 
The total loss of life in the Titanic disaster is probably 1,342. Captain of Virginian sent the following wireless to the home office. Virginian reached Titanic too late. No survivors on board. Proceeding Liverpool. The Carpathia has 868 aboard. Strange message. The message received by the parents of J.A. Phillips, the wireless operator on the Titanic last night, stating, Making solely for Halifax, practically unsinkable, don't worry. When sent by an uncle of the operator in London to Godalming, where the father lives, and the parents assumed that it had come from their son as it was signed Phillips. The transatlantic lines have agreed in consequence of reports as to ice in the Atlantic to cross longitude 47 in latitude 4010 eastbound, beginning today and longitude 47 latitude 41 westbound beginning April 25th. Winnipeg, like scores of other communities across Canada, was extremely concerned about its own who were on board the Titanic. In this article, Anxiety in Winnipeg, note, heard from Mrs. Mark Fortune, Miss Alice Fortune, and others, not heard from Mark Fortune, Master Charles Fortune, Hugo Ross, Thomas Beatty, and others. Here, a picture of Thomas Beatty, by the way, of the local realty firm. An anxious crowd waited about the local office of the White Star Line all morning, waiting for, for news, news of, friends of friends or relatives, or relatives who were supposed to be on board the Titanic, which struck an iceberg in mid-ocean on Sunday night and floundered, taking the great majority of the passengers with her to the bottom of the sea. Shortly after noon, a dispatch was received from the headquarters of the White Star Line in New York, containing the welcome news that Mrs. Mark Fortune and her three daughters were among those who were saved by the Carpathia. Early dispatches mentioned only that Mrs. Fortune and Mrs. Alice Fortune were among the saved. Much relief was felt when it was announced that the other two daughters, Miss Mabel and Miss Ethel, were also among the saved. The fate of Mark Fortune and his son, Master Charles Fortune, like that of Thomas Beatty, Hugo Ross, J.J. Horbank, and George Graham, is not known, but it is generally thought that they were among those who perished, as the large majority of those who have been saved were women and children. There is still much doubt expressed whether the Mr. Graham mentioned in the most recent dispatch as being among the saved was George Graham, the Winnipeg man who was a buyer for Eaton's. It was denied at first that Mr. Graham was on board the Titanic, but a dispatch from Toronto states that he was, as his mother in that city received a Marconi gram from him the day before the accident. In this article, Rescued will arrive in New York tomorrow, a most interesting comment from then Prime Minister of uh, Britain, Premier Asquith, in which he said, Perhaps the House will allow me to add this, that I am afraid we must brace ourselves to confront one of the terrible events in the order of providence which baffle foresight, which appall the imagination, and make us realize the inadequacy of words to do justice to what we feel. In those early days of the Marconi Graham and before the advent of modern radio and telephone communications, the full story of the Titanic's tragedy had not yet been revealed. On this first page of April the 17th, Titanic tragedy appears greater. The full dimensions of those rescued on the Carpathia were only coming to an understanding. As the ship drew near with some 868 survivors on board, it became very clear that the great loss had been in the steerage and in the third class passenger sections of the ship. So far, only 328 names of those saved have been received. These include 79 men, 233 women, and 13 children. It is thought these are all the first and second class passengers saved, and of the other 540, there are only 14 seamen who are required to man the boats. News of the Winnipeg people. Ten from City and one from Vancouver were on board the Titanic. Four certainly safe. Latest reports from all sources indicate that 11 Western Canadians, 10 Winnipeggers, and one from Vancouver were aboard, aboard the ill-fated liner. Hope of the safety of the Western Canadian Titanic passengers, so cruelly raised at first, was shattered by later reports and suspense again gave place to certainty. So far, only four Winnipeggers are definitely reported as safe. These are Mrs. Mark Fortune and her three daughters, the Mrs. Alice, Ethel, and Mabel. Doubt still lingers as to the fate of Georgie Graham, buyer for the Eaton Company here. Conflicting reports are being received through the conviction is gradually settling down that he too is lying with the huge liner at the bottom of the sea. 
six other Western Canadians, Thompson Beatty, J.J. Borbank, Hugo Ross, Mark Fortune and his son Charles are reported as lost and while certainty has not developed owing to lack of confirmation from the rescuing liners, it is thought that they must be lost. Thomas McCaffrey, manager of the Union Bank at Vancouver, did board the ill-fated vessel at Southampton just before it sailed. No word has been received about him, but it is thought that he too is dead. Mr. McCaffrey was for many years Union Bank manager at Minnedosa and later Nipua, Manitoba, removing ultimately to Vancouver. And note this tragic piece of irony in the telegram from Hugo Ross, one of those on board the Titanic. The following message from Hugo Ross, received today by R.L. Richardson, March the 15th. This is a great trip, but only wish Dunk were along to stand off the daily grafters, etc. Going from here to Naples, to Rome, to London and home. Hope the boys home are all well and weather easier. Yours truly, Hugo. Even on Thursday, April the 18th, the headlines were completely taken over by the sinking of the Titanic. On this one, Titanic was plunged into darkness in four minutes. Not precisely correct, but getting there. From Himlin Light, Massachusetts, a 1 a.m. special. By a wireless Captain Rostrum of the Carpathia says, I know for sure there were no lives saved except those I have on board. I have not the body of Colonel John J. Astor on board. Mrs. Astor is very sick, dangerously ill. More than 100 are sick and in the hospital. When the collision occurred, about 200 sailors sleeping in the bow of the Titanic were drowned like rats. After the impact of the Titanic, the lights went out in four minutes. The dynamo lasted about the same time, which caused the wireless operator to abandon his calls for help as the storage battery was only capable of carrying from 50 to 100 miles. The wireless operator was rendered helpless. This article entitled Widow's Message. The widow of Captain Smith, commander of the Titanic, has written a pathetic message which was posted today outside the White Star offices. It read, read as, follows. as follows. To my poor fellow sufferers, my heart overflows with grief for you all to my poor fellow sufferers. My heart overflows with grief for you all and is laden with sorrow that you are weighed down with this terrible burden that has been thrust upon us. May God be with us and comfort us all. Yours in deep sympathy, Eleanor Smith. Winnipeg lost five noble sons in the tragedy. Notice this article. Winnipeg mourns two families on way to relatives. The city hall flag is flying at half mast today on account of the drowning of the five Winnipeg men on the ill-fated Titanic. Titanic. Great anxiety still prevails throughout the city, though all hope for the safety of the Winnipeg men have been abandoned. Some doubt still prevails as to the fate of Miss Ethel Fortune, though the company has had advices saying that she has been rescued. The company concedes that in all human probability, the Winnipeg men who were on board have gone down with the ship. About the local offices of the White Star Liner this morning, there was an atmosphere of deep gloom. No further advances have been made since last night. Yesterday afternoon and this morning, many persons who had booked passages across the Atlantic came into the office and cancelled their sailings. One of the first was a minister who declared that on account of the accident to the Titanic, he would never cross the ocean, and others were women and persons who intended to take picture trips to the continent. Many distinguished men among Titanic victims. There have been disasters in the course of history in which the toll of life has been as great as that now claimed by the sea from, from the, the ship Titanic. Titanic. But it may be doubted whether such a list of distinguished men has ever been simultaneously carried to death as on this occasion, except in the case of war or battle. Among those who have perished in this wreck are men who lead the way in the world of fashion and wealth in railroading, journalism, commerce, literature, and many of the other walks of life. There is not the slightest doubt but that their sudden call from life will make a loss and vacancy which will not easily be filled. As a follow-up to that last article on the strangling of the young girl in Winnipeg, this article, Many Think Red Light Area Will Be Cleaned Out, is of particular interest. When the sordid details of Monday's tragedy at 176 McFarland Street were published, Many, Many people, people confidently, confidently expressed, expressed the opinion that it would mean the end of Winnipeg's red light area. 
that the women themselves thought it was the signal for a raid was evident by the large number of women resident there who hastily packed grips and left for quieter localities. An authority states that but few owners of houses could be found in the district last night, they having left on short vacations until they could ascertain what was going to happen. Many of the girls, too temporarily, left McFarlane and Rachel Streets, portions of Sutherland Avenue, Rorcha and Syndicate Streets, to which the houses of vice have spread. Not all news was bad news in this particular week. 1912 was a optimistic time in the history of the Canadian West. If the railroads were coming to town, then its future was certain. In this particular ad, a most interesting ad, by the way, on Canora, at C-A-N-O-R-A, -A, Saskatchewan, an image, a visual image of this little town being serviced by so many different railroads. The Canadian National Railroad, the Grand Trunk Pacific, soon to be the Saskatchewan Central Railway. And notice the little banner, Railroads Assure the Future of Kenora. Classic representation of the importance of railroads in the development of the Canadian West. On an earlier program, we talked about the author Ralph Connor and his splendid pen. It was Ralph Connor who took up that pen to talk about this disaster in a way perhaps no other Canadian author was able to speak of it. In this article, entitled Ralph Connor Speaks on Disaster, a tugging perception of the Titanic's sinking. The mind simply refuses to dwell upon the heart-piercing scenes enacted during those two fatal hours upon the gently heaving floor of the ice-strewn Atlantic under the calm stars of heaven. Now and then a picture grips the mind, but the mind refuses to endure the agony, shakes itself free, and a good thing it is too, else life would be intolerable. Even those who have passed through those scenes will never be able to get the full impact of their agony at any one time, nor should one seek to dwell upon them. Rather, one should allow the mind to turn and rest upon those splendid instances of heroism, tenderness, and endurance that the early stories of the wreck report. Heroism was not confined to any class. The wealthy and luxurious Astor, kissing his wife farewell with a tender goodbye, dearie, and in obedience to the officer's command, stepping back quietly to his place with the men. The quiet courage of the Englishman coming out to farm near Winnipeg with his wife and daughter, who surrendering his place of safety, kissing his loved ones goodbye, that another woman might be saved. The Frenchman who approaching one of the boats with his two beautiful little boys and ordered sternly back by the officer replied, bless you, I don't want to go, but for God's sake, take the boys. Their mother is waiting for them in New York. These representing three great nationalities, and I suppose three classes of men, stand out as types of heroism that awaken in our hearts a new pride in mankind. The sinking of the Titanic is graphically portrayed in this pathetic advertisement by the T. Eaton Company for April the 19th. Store closes Saturday at one o'clock. We announce the closing of this store Saturday at one o'clock as a mark of appreciation, love and respect of our late business associate, George E. Graham, who perished on the ill-fated steamer Titanic, an entire page advertisement and announcement. Even by Saturday, five or six days after the sinking of the Titanic, the news of the tragedy was still front and center. Mrs. Fortune tells of rescue. So Winnipeg survivors give graphic story of their escape from death. How one man escaped from the Titanic dressed in women's clothes, even to have bail when the ship's officers were not permitting men, with the exception of those who manned the lifeboats, to leave the sinking ship, was told by Mrs. Mark Fortune today with her son in law, H.C. Hutton of Winnipeg, Manitoba. Mrs. Fortune, with her daughters, the Mrs. Ethel, Mabel, and Alice, are at the Hotel Belmont. The husband and father and the brother of the family perished. Mrs. Fortune was aroused by her son Charles knocking at the door of the cabin dressed hurriedly. He told her the ship had struck an iceberg and was in danger. About the same time, a steward rushed through the passage and yelled, there is no danger, the ship can't sink. The women were not inclined to take things as calmly as the steward wanted them to and hurriedly dressed. 
On their way to the deck, they were joined by Mrs. Fortune and Charles. On the stairway, they were met by officers who informed the father and son that they would not be permitted to go any further. The women were instructed to get into a lifeboat, but still they did not realize the ship was in danger. One of the Fortune girls called back to her brother, Charles, you look after father. That was the only message that passed between them. The mother and daughters were placed in lifeboat number 10. It was terribly overcrowded. Mrs. Fortune told her son-in-law that with the exception of a Chinaman, a stoker, and four men who were to man the boat, all in it were supposed to be women. It became necessary to transfer these four men to another boat, which was without a crew. This left only the Chinaman to row. About this time, the discovery was made that a veiled person in woman's clothes was a man. He made no explanations to why he was so dressed, and none was asked of him, but that he had donned the clothes to escape with women when men were being held back to die. There was no question, nor did anyone ask his name or learn it later. The only request made of him was that he take an oar. This he did reluctantly. The Chinaman and Stoker knew almost nothing about rowing, and the man in woman's clothing knew less. One of the fortune girls and another girl got out an oar each and helped to haul away from the wreck. The family agreed that they were in the boat about one hour after the liner struck. At 2.15 the next morning, as far as they can remember, they saw the stern of the Titanic hoist itself in the air. A crowd could be seen struggling. In all, 1,502 passengers of the fateful Titanic voyage perished. The SS Carpathia picked up 866 survivors, and Winnipeg owes two of its street names to the disaster. Hugo and Borbank. Carpathia Street was named for the rescue ship. The Winnipeg Tribune's eight-ton scrapbook, consisting of some 78,000 clipping files and over half a million photographs, is available only here at the Department of Archives and Special Collections at the University of Manitoba. But this is only a portion of the wealth of manuscript and archival material available here. We specialize in Canadian literary collections and those of prairie agriculture, and the department's holdings are available on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. Remember, today's news is tomorrow's history, which will never go out of date or out of fashion. Thank you.